The Internet History Podcast is brought to you by MetaLab. Their slogan is MetaLab, we make interfaces. For a decade, MetaLab has helped some of the world's top companies and entrepreneurs build products that millions of people use every day. You probably didn't realize it at the time, but the odds are you've used an app that they've helped design or build. Apps like Slack, Coinbase, Facebook Messenger, Oculus, Lonely Planet, and many more. MetaLab wants to bring their unique design philosophy to your project. Let them take your brainstorm and turn it into the next billion-dollar app, from idea sketched on the back of a napkin to a final shipped product. Check them out at metalab.co. That's metalab.co. Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. This is a super cool one. This story has gone down in Silicon Valley lore as the ultimate cautionary tale. Dig was once the earliest high-flying startup in the social media space. But then other social media startups like Facebook and Twitter started to steal the limelight, so Dig tried to keep up by launching its infamous Dig version 4. And it's a disaster. Users hate it. They hate it so much that many people feel that the reason that Reddit is Reddit today is because the Dig community fled to Reddit en masse. Dig version 4 has become a much-cited horror story of how a redesign can be so disruptive it can kill an entire company. So what's the real story behind this legend? Today we talk to Will Larson, who today is at Stripe, but back in the day was a young engineer working on the launch of Dig version 4. I could not be more jazzed that he shares with us the real inside story, why Dig probably had to do what it did, and what valuable lessons you can learn from a launch that goes so sideways it potentially sinks everything. Will Larson, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I, uh, I think it would be useful to get a little bit of your background. Um, was, your, was your first job out of college <laughs> sort of developing for the App Store uh, as a solo developer? That's a great question. So my, my real first job out of college was actually teaching English in Japan. Mm. I did that for a year. Uh, then I came back, uh, had no idea how to actually get a job, panicked a little bit. Uh, a friend of mine and I, we wrote, we, uh, we wrote a tower defense game. You can imagine uh, we sold thousands of dollars worth of this game <laughs> after you know many months of, of effort, which uh, was actually pretty neat to have sold something for the first time, but was financially like just a complete disaster, paying like far less than teaching English. Then was at Yahoo for a couple of years, and then followed uh, our product manager went to Dig. You know, come to Dig, you're going to get rich. Worst case, you'll make a couple hundred thousand in a year. Uh, and then and then I was at Dig. Okay, a uh, couple couple follow ups on what you just said. Uh, so this is like literally the first year of the App Store when when Apple first opens it up, right? It was yeah, it was it was the gold rush era. <clears throat> it, uh, no one could not get rich other than me and my friend. Uh, I think everyone else did very well in that era. We we did not quite figure out the formula. In in retrospect, do you have an idea of why you failed at that? Yeah, I, it's kind of the classic, like, clueless, you know, I guess we were 22 and 23 at the time, kids trying to do something but not really knowing how to do it and thinking if we just spent more time programming, like, people would start buying our game and maybe, like, that wasn't the entire problem. I uh, The second one would be, I don't think I've spoken to anyone that was at Yahoo um, that late in the Yahoo story. Um, is there anything, uh, I know that was your first job, so maybe you don't have the best perspective on that, or maybe you do now in retrospect, um, what, what was Yahoo like at the tail end of, of the aughts? That's a great question. 
so, so I was in Yahoo Search. Uh, originally, Yahoo Search was this company called Inktomi. And the amazing thing is we got acquired something like six, seven, eight, nine years before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But in Yahoo Search, we still use the slide material from Inktomi. So people would literally make a, a presentation from Inktomi, this company that acquired was acquired, you know, like eight, nine years before. So you, you could say that they didn't fully integrate. And that would be, I think, an accurate statement. But it was a pretty interesting place to be. Uh, only one or two CEO changes during my two years there, which I think was like low for the historical kind of average of CEO changes at that era. Uh, pr- pretty pretty fascinating place. I think doing a lot of great technology work. Uh, also doing a lot of layoffs, as you might imagine. Right, yeah. So um, you said you followed somebody to Dig. Um, were, were you a Dig user? So that's an interesting question. So a little bit. I think once I joined Dig, I really fell in love with the products and the community. But going into it, it I wasn't I wasn't a heavy user by any means. It was spent a little bit more time on, on Reddit, a little bit more time like Hacker News. Um, but I, I think many people who did use Dig would not describe Dig's community as kind of the most aspirational, positive community. But really, once I got there and got to interact with them, I, I did fall in love with them a little bit. Okay, that's super interesting that you were already more um, of a Reddit partisan because that sort of ties into this story. So if you'll indulge me just for a little bit, <clears throat> because it is more than a decade on now, uh, the Dig story, uh, if you're listening, obviously you can Wikipedia it, but um, you know, founded by Kevin Rose uh, in like 2003 or 2004, and it shouldn't be under... You shouldn't underestimate how much that it was important in in terms of like being one of the early stars of the Web 2.0 era. Um, before there were things like like buttons and tweet this buttons on every web page, there were dig this buttons, and dig was essentially a social user generated news site where you would vote up and down stories. Um, is there any? Am I, am I leaving out any details? I, I, again, you weren't there at the beginning, but like the 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 history of Dig uh, before you got there. I, I think there's a, a great deal of kind of early Dig stories that are fantastic. I, I think the the very first Genesis story is uh, Kevin Rose. He was uh, on This Week in Tech, This Week in Tech, which was this TV show on mm-hmm. this like now defunct um, like tech TV channel. I think. And so he, he actually intro dig uh, as if it was not his, kind of talking about what this amazing new site was that he had found. And that was actually how people first found out about it, um, was him kind of introducing it as if he had not, was not in fact the founder of the site. So they kind of just starting from that, like Genesis story, which is kind of amazing. And you can actually find the clips out there still if you, if you really try. Um, but then uh, dig really innovated in a lot of important ways. I think you, you mentioned the dig button. And that was really the first button like that. And, you know, a couple of the times we literally broke the Internet when our button didn't load properly and just mm-hmm. like CNN couldn't load. And it's kind of amazing. You know, this, this site had this power to, to, to literally break the Internet. Um, well, right, because also- because it was integrated. But also, um, you know, uh, there were things like slash dot. You got slash dotted. You get a ton of traffic and and, you know, Metafilter also had. But but dig was in in this era of like, you know, entire companies can live and die by the traffic stream that that Facebook can deliver or some or you know um dig was like really the first one to get on people's radar that like this can drive a meaningful meaningful level of traffic to 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 certain sites yeah the dig effect and it it was it was real there were people whose entire living was helping bring the dig audience to other people's sites and so they would just try to game the system and they made like pretty good money just trying to game the algorithm to get their sites on the top of the big front page. Um, and uh, b- before we, we get back to, to your story and all this, um, th- that's also a key component that we need to, to talk about is that so Dig had it was community, you know, it, at the time, of course, it was definitely called a part lumped in with the social media stuff. But it's mostly voting it's mostly it, it, the the modern analogy would be kind of what reddit does kind of what hacker news does but there was also the fact that users had a reputation so that at some point and and maybe i'm getting the chronology wrong but this is how i remember it at the time 
if you if you gained enough of a reputation as uh, as someone that dug um, important stories, then your votes had more influence, right? So the, the algorithm went through kind of varying levels of sophistication, and I think you know, like most startup technology is is fifty percent technology and fifty percent hand waving. And I think the algorithm evolved from like very heavy hand waving to something like pretty sophisticated over time. And at various points, it worked exactly the way you described. There's also like reputation for different sites. Um, there were at different points in time, there were actually human moderators that were kind of ensuring the stories were high quality. Um, it, it went through a bunch of different evolutions over time. Okay, one more summation and then we'll get back to it. So <clears throat> again, and I remember this extremely clearly, you know, uh, Kevin on on the cover of, uh, was it Business Week or I don't remember who. But Newsweek. Newsweek, Newsweek, yeah. And again, this is like around 2005. So like these are the first signs and stirrings that like, um, you know, tech is coming back. Silicon Valley is coming back. Web 2.0, you know, uh, it, that story was like the first time I remember people saying, oh, no, there's a bubble in tech again. And it was like, you know, Dig is worth $100 million. Oh, my God. <laughs> but um so it, it 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 was super successful. Did you know was was driving hundreds of millions in terms of uh, page views and traffic and things like that, and was signing big ad deals with I think it was MSN and things like that. Um, okay, so we're we're coming back to you. Uh, what year do you join, Dig? I think I joined in. Uh, this is a great question. I, I think I joined in about 2012. Sounds right. Hmm. And you know what? I, that doesn't sound right to me. So I'm about to check your LinkedIn. Your LinkedIn says 20. Yeah, let me let me figure this out. 20. So After reason backwards each time. It's, okay, that 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 actually sounds more right. You're yeah. you're you're right. You're just a software engineer, and then in 2011, it says on your LinkedIn, it goes. And I, who am I to tell you? But <laughs> director of engineer. Okay. I, but I, I think it's important to to say 2010 because we're what we're going to tell the story of is the story of of version. 4.0. So I think in my research last night about this, um, the the uh, addition of voting came in version 2.0 of Dig, which was in 2005. Dig version 3 added categories and things like that, um, and then a view all section, so you like had a home page for all the categories and things like that. So you're joining in 2010, and um, Version four is coming out, but it had been work. It had been in the works for like two years or something like that. So there was actually a version three point five, which mm. wasn't vetted greatly, but it was kind of a design reset, um, improving kind of a, a much richer set of categories, uh, and generally one that's like just like a, a small incremental improvement that was just kind of better in every way over V three. Um, but then yeah, so we'd been working on V four for a couple of years at that point. Um, in, in that era, you can see like. Facebook, Twitter doing incredibly well. Mm. And we're trying to understand, like, you see these truly social media sites and dig to your earlier point with more of a community-based site. And we're trying to understand, um, we see these social media sites just get tremendous growth, tons of users, very passionate users, kind of the, the number of people using them every day, just skyrocketing, trying to figure out how can we bring some of that um, magic to, to dig. Okay, that's. Uh, I think that's important to underline. So again, as I'm describing it in 2005, dig is one of the big standouts of the Web 2.0 era, and then uh, five years on, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, every the, the whole game is maybe past dig by a little bit, and and not only in terms of users, but in terms of like what we were talking about, like there's people are are more used to getting uh, finding sites, finding information, finding news by 2010 from Facebook and Twitter. So you, so Dig is trying to understand that and adapt to that. Exactly. And just trying to understand how... So you mentioned kind of there's the Kevin Rose um, profile piece. And, and actually, when you walked into the Dig office, that was framed. That was really the first thing you saw was that, that front page framed. And we were supposed to be this kind of up-and-coming kind of critical internet company and now we're seeing these kind of upstarts that were starting to pass us by, and we really wanted to figure out how we could start being part of the conversation again. Is is Kevin still there when when you join? So the the day before I joined, uh, the, the current CEO at that time, Jay Adelson, left, um, and then Kevin did come back for 
three or four months, I think, maybe it was up to six months. And then we had another CEO who came in after that. Um, and um, what would you, again, I guess maybe this is better to, now that you have experience with several different startups and different companies, what was, what was the scene like when you show up? What was the culture like? I think if you've ever been in a company that is behind on a huge release and knows it's behind, I think there there was a lot of, on one hand, excitement about kind of getting this thing out the door. But on the other hand, I think a lot of just deep terror about figuring out how we could actually get this thing launched. It had been a real bear to get it to a spot where it was shippable. It was missing a bunch of features. And, and honestly, this wasn't clear to me at the time that I started, but we were also running out of money. And so there was a lot of, I think, pressure to, to figure out how we could make this work. Right, because uh, the, the Google Panda update had happened recently and that like killed your traffic. So uh, a helpful Redditor uh, commented on my piece that I was wrong and Panda actually happened in 2012, but it was a different unnamed algorithm change gotcha. that happened. Um, but the, the impact was, was the same. Our, our traffic used to be heavily driven by Google, um, almost half of it on a monthly basis. And we were getting paid with ads on those pages. And once that dropped, we went from kind of one month of like golden profitability. Like we had finally made it um, way back into the red when that algorithm change hit. Right. So, all right. <laughs> you're a startup. You're joining a startup that finally has become profitable for the first time. And literally overnight, everything goes to shit again. And um, as you mentioned in, in your blog post about this, that's going to make uh, raising more money difficult because you would have to raise money at, uh, you know, in a position of weakness. Absolutely. I think we had also raised money pretty recently. And so it's going to be hard for us to raise at a, even an equivalent valuation once we lost that trajectory. And I'm, Ultimately, it was like a pretty interesting situation. So if you look at Dig, um, the, the other companies that were in the funding rounds from some of the, the top investors had already done very, very well. Like there were some of the investors were those, the same kind of rounds that had gotten stakes in Facebook. And so they, they were basically golden for those rounds. And we were increasingly like unimportant for them. And so actually one of the interesting things was like we were starting to kind of fail but our investors had done very well in their existing portfolio, so they weren't too worried about it. But uh, we were, were very worried about it, as you might imagine. Okay, so, and please correct me if I'm getting this wrong or overgeneralizing, but the, ver the, the goal of version four of DIG is to try to move into the... Uh, as opposed to just being a a news aggregator and like a voting site, it, trying to integrate more things like the the social graph and and who you follow and influencers and things like that, right? I think that's exactly right. Going from just this community based news algorithm to overlaying kind of your social graph on the community news and getting the best of both was kind of the the dream for us. And you describe in in your blog post that. Um, and you make a point about this. You say that um, you guys basically decided we have to launch even though you know at the time it's probably not ready. It, it's definitely not something I've done before or done, done since, but I, I think there was a sense of we were two months or sorry, two years behind. Uh, it, it wasn't obvious that we were converging on kind of a, a strong product. Uh, the amount of money we had saved was getting to a place where we wouldn't have enough time to even see if it worked, where we, even if we launched something phenomenal, we wouldn't be able to actually see the metrics move. We wouldn't have enough time. So it really came down to, did we want to, to try or did we want to just kind of go home? Um, although I would say it wasn't that obvious to us at the time that the numbers were like, well, the, the funding was in such a perilous spot. So I think for a lot of us, initially, it seemed very foolhardy to kind of go ahead with the launch. Although as things became clearer later on, I, I kind of am a convert that I'm glad we, we tried, even if it didn't specifically work out as well as I hoped it would. Right. So as an engineer from that level, you might not know the financials, but you, you guys clearly do have the sense that, like you said, you're behind the times, you're behind these new upstarts that are that are clearly racing ahead of you. 
so you, you sometimes you see kind of waves of people leaving companies and, you, and you, you start to wonder why is that happening? And Dig was definitely a place that had lost many of its best engineers by the time I was there. Um, still a bunch of phenomenal people, um, some people that I've gotten to work with since and just really like amazed by. But, but a lot of them had left as well by the time I was there. And I, you, you get the sign or the sense that they know something. And so you don't quite know what they know. Uh, but they know something and they're kind of leaving in, in pretty large numbers. So it was definitely clear something was going on, but it, it took a little while to figure out exactly what. Um, are there also constraints in terms of, um, you know, because we're almost about to get into like the actual launch in that story, but um, do you know going into it that you might not have the resources to do this the right way? Also, like your existing infrastructure uh, is also sort of rickety? So, so, so Dig, uh, as almost all startups at the time were, was running in like on physical servers, there, there, the cloud existed at that point, but it wasn't kind of widespread. And so there, there was a sense that we didn't necessarily have enough capacity, but it wasn't completely obvious until we actually started launching how true that was uh all right well then i guess it's it's time to do it uh please please describe uh the launch in as much detail as you're willing to do and and if you want to just go I'll, i'm gonna let you go awesome so I, I think you know i think i'd been there for about six months maybe seven uh, and we had decided to launch. We you had, you know, the, the press material set up. Uh, we had prepared the, the software as best we could. Uh, we rearranged the entire office. Uh, we have a, a giant table in the middle of the room. And, you know, we, we go home and we're going to go in the next day and just ship this thing. So we kind of trickle into the office. Uh, and and it's just kind of all decked out. They had professional lighting set up. They actually had just like, so it's almost like a, a festival or something. They just had lights set up everywhere. Uh, they had professional waiters kind of in their like black tie bringing around champagne. They had a, a bar set up so, like the sushi on platters getting passed around. And, you know, uh, we decided to launch and, and it was, it took a little while to figure out that we were launching because there wasn't just like a big button to flip over. In fact, we, hadn't even provisioned any of the new software yet. So the first step was actually taking the old servers, uh, wiping them down, resetting them, and installing the new software on that. And so this is not normally how you would launch a new site. Normally how you would launch a site is you have the old one, you, you spin up a new copy, and then you kind of point to the new one. If something goes really badly, if the new one doesn't work, if it doesn't handle the scale properly, just point back to the old one, right? It's kind of a time, a battle-tested, true strategy for like a, a peaceful migration. And, and we just did like the complete opposite. So what, what we realized as we were going is we didn't have enough capacity to run the new site at all. And so there was a decision, do we, do we pause? Do we uh, slow down a little bit and make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing? Or do we just scale forward? And we really, we really embraced the latter. I think it's, if you imagine the moment surrounded by these waiters with champagne, open bar, uh, do you do you have the bravery to say this is a terrible idea, or do you just fail forward? And, and really, we just we just went with it, and we reprovisioned every single host from the old infrastructure and ran put the new software on it, and then um, then it didn't really didn't really turn on, and, and that was that was a surprising moment for us, as you might imagine. So wait, wait, wait. And, and that, when you say it, it, it didn't really turn on, so are you in a state where it's like, all right, we've shut down the old one and the new one's not there? Like, are you kind of stuck in limbo at some point? So I think if you had been a like a impassive observer who wasn't specifically implicated in it not turning on, I think that that's kind of how you might describe it. I think rather than in limbo, you might say that we were, we were in a bit of hell at that moment. <laughs> because, yeah, it was, um, it was, a, it was a pretty surprising moment. I, I don't think we were completely shocked, but, but, you know, p part of working at a company uh, going through those circumstances is like, you really do have to kind of believe 
um, or, or be really optimistic about things working out. And even though I think like intellectually we knew it wasn't super likely this was just going to flip on perfectly, I think there was like a, a kernel of hope that we held that this is just somehow it was just going to really work. Um, and when we had fully provisioned it and it was just not loading, I think that's the point where that kernel kind of expired and, and we started to realize we, we had a bit of a problem on our hands. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? So at, at that point, um, we, we start, you know, firefighting. We, we have a, this giant table in the middle of the room, all of the folks surrounding it. We just start, you know, assigning tasks, trying to figure out what to do. We throw up a big error page, so at least people have a, a page saying, you know, coming back soon. Um, you, you know, folks are getting calls from the press kind of wondering, which is just wild to think about, but actually this was like newsworthy. When you wrote a, a blog post on the big blog, it showed up on Tech Team. Like well, people no. cared about that thing. I, actually, I remember, like, there was a big roll-up to it. Like, this was expected. Like, I feel like Mike Arrington was... was you know, Dig is finally doing its redesign. So, like, yeah, I remember this being something that people were anticipating. And it's funny because, like, a Facebook now doesn't do, like, big launches for the most part on their user product. It's kind of remained stable. But, um, but yeah, like you said, there, there was press. There were, there were people excited. Um, a lot of the influencers around the Valley had been beta testers, um, and we'd been running the beta test for, for some time. And they, they loved it or at least, like, said they loved it. Um, so, so there was there was some expectation that that we launched something uh, and not kind of an empty page. But for us, you know, just getting an empty page, kind of you know, come back soon. Um, we're upgrading. It was kind of a a triumph because at least we had something versus just hanging indefinitely. But um, you know, on Twitter, on, on the forums, like folks were were concerned. Folks like had a lot of energy invested into Dig, and they had been coming here for this exciting cutover moment. Instead, they were starting to get the sense that something was not quite clicking. Uh, in internally, though, we knew it wasn't quite clicking. We, we knew um, it was going to take some work. So we, we split up a um, couple of different working groups. Um, one working group just fixing like tons of little bugs that had started popping up. Another working group trying to debug some of the performance problems. And then another working group that started adding different layers of caching. Um, one of the interesting things that we did is we used this technology called Cassandra, which is still kind of in the open source today. And it's originally written by Facebook. Um, it, Facebook open sourced it, but it turns out Facebook didn't really use Cassandra internally much anymore. And it's actually been called the, the Trojan horse that Facebook released into Silicon Valley to kind of ruin a whole generation of competitors. And sometimes it did it did work kind of how you would expect of a Trojan horse. It worked great for a little bit, uh, but then would kind of not scale particularly well, particularly the early versions. It's a much more mature, like great piece of technology today. But but at that point, it was it was pretty rocky, as as we found out. Um. So I mean, if I'm a user, how long am I unable to access it? I think that probably within 12 hours, you could kind of see the front page <clears throat> if you were logged out. So, so something that part of the the core functionality that we had added in D4 over like D3.5 was this kind of social um, activity. The kind of each for each story you could see which of your friends had interacted with it. Um, so as long as you were logged out, none of that functionality got invoked, and you could actually see the front page. Of course, the interesting thing at this moment. Is the front page, what is the front page if no one can actually log in to vote on anything? Mm. And so we were just picking random stuff. It was like literally what was happening just to get something on there. Um, the, the admin team was just picking stuff to, to inject into it. So there was some content. And, and we did get to the point pretty quickly. Um, well, I, I don't know if you'd call 12 hours pretty quickly. Um, eventually, maybe, uh, we got to the point where if you were a logged out user, the site was restored. Um, it, like, still much of our traffic comes from search or came from search. So if you came to the front page or if you came to the individual article page, um, and then that started working for the logged out users. But uh, the, the community, the people who were really passionate about the site, but also like, you know, probably one or 200 of whom like literally made their livings kind of getting content onto the site. None of them could access it. So particularly that latter group, 
um, was getting pretty uncomfortable 12 hours in when they realized they just couldn't get onto the site um, and that it might not be working for a little bit longer. And and so what level of hair on fire are, are you guys uh, around that big table? I, I think we, we were we were pretty calm, all things considering. I, I, I think we it was a pretty professional group. It was a thoughtful group. And they they knew we knew that if we panicked, we weren't more likely to succeed. But I, I think there was a good amount of stress, and it it was just a surprising day. And I think you know people were people were drinking the champagne, people were eating the sushi, and people were contemplating um, how to get out of this hole. But but ultimately, I do think it's a bit of a a triumph of that group that over the next day we we did get things working. And it it was not obvious at all, you know, like two hours in that this was ever going to work again. And so I, I am like quite impressed that, mm. that we got it working. Although there were there were lingering problems for quite some time. Uh, it took us a full month before it really worked properly without rolling restarts. But I don't know. It, I was pretty proud to see the group pull through. And, and that's definitely kind of a, a cherished memory, the success of it, uh, even though the the darkest moments were some of the, the worst work I think I've ever done. I'm, I'm, I'm a little curious. Uh, I'm sorry about the darkest moment. Cause there's a, there's a story in eBay's history too. Uh, sometime in the late nineties where they thought that they might've lost forever the entire reputation system. And this is at a time when there was lots of other um, auction competitors. And so like they were literally contemplating like, have we have we thrown away everything that that is keeping people on the site like did you guys have a moment like that like you just said like for about two hours like maybe maybe it's 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 all blown you know i think one of the the most spectacular things that happened that day is i think the people who are really focused on getting it up were, were really the engineers i think there are, there are a lot of companies out there where there would have been an exact kind of screaming at us or, or, or running this kind of like resistance um, to like bringing the team together. But, but what I'd say is a lot of the engineers at dig were really passionate about dig really believed in the site and really believed in the community and the product that we we're offering. Although one of them once said, we shouldn't worry about downtime because all we did was find pictures of cats. Uh, and there's like some truth to that. Like dig was a large vector for cat pictures. Um, but the people really believed in it. And so I, I think as a testament to kind of both the engineering team, but also the leadership, there wasn't kind of a like angry person kind of yelling or, or there wasn't like a lot of like anger or frustration. It was really just people terrified of how to like get the damn thing working. But, but it was, it was like a pretty positive atmosphere, all things considered. And, and I do think that was like something um, that was pretty remarkable that, that people actually didn't kind of turn on each other in that moment, but instead really did come together trying to figure out how to make it work. So you do, as you say, generally get things running again. Were, were there still issues uh, for, you know, maybe days or weeks afterwards in terms of like slowness or, or page loading or anything like that? I think, <clears throat> I, I think it would be hard to say or hard to find something that did not have issues over the next like two weeks. <laughs> Like, I, I don't think anything worked particularly well. And it was really a full month before it fully worked. I think the most interesting bug that we had was um, initially after we launched, every three or four hours, everything would just stop working. And, you know, we would have to restart everything. We, we were pretty sure that only one piece of the system was breaking, but we couldn't figure out which piece, which meant every three to four hours, we were just like restarting everything. We started adding some more caching um, so that would allow us to store the results in memory instead of reading them off in disk, which is a little bit slower. And that, that meant that, um, instead of every three or four hours, now we're restarting it every, you know, 10 hours or so, which was a, a little bit of a victory, but it was still pretty bewildering. Like, why do we have to keep restarting everything? Um, and, and it took us, it took us like honestly a month to figure that one out. And, and to your earlier question about when it got the darkest, I think this bug is when it got the darkest for me. I think a lot of people realized that the company was not going to be able to pay them for a long time going forward. And a lot of them were just like starting to look for jobs, which like, honestly, like I, 
power to them. I think that was really pretty insightful of them. And I think at, I was just quite naive to think the most important thing in my life at that point was to, to figure out this bug it was probably like having a job might have been an important thing to be thinking about too. But yeah. but really, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say uh, in, in your blog post, which I'll, I'll link to in the show notes, of course, like, you, it, like it, it's, it's kind of... <laughs> It's kind of endearing the way you describe is like other people are, are going for the life preservers, but you're like, I'm going to fix this, damn it. I think there's just like a moment, um, particularly I, I see, think of this as something of an engineering um, trait where you just see a problem and you, you try to fix it and then you fail and you try again, then you fail and then you just get like, you know, like I'm, I'm going to figure this one out. And I think for me that this last bug this kind of crashing bug really was that moment. And I think that wasn't true for most others at that point. I think by the end, it really did feel like me and like one or two other people were trying to figure this out. And the rest of folks were kind of, you know, polishing up their resume. And again, like, I think probably they were the people making the, the right decision. And, but I just was so fixated on, on figuring this one out that I really did spend, I think, you know, three or four weeks heads down, working with one or two other people, just trying to make the damn thing work. Okay. Um, so before, before we end this, I need to, I want to poke at this specifically. So this has gone down in lore as sort of like a redesign that kills a product or a company or something. And, um, you know, a lot of the press at the time and even stuff that I've dug up to research this, um, it's all about, the the design like mashable runs a poll and says that the previous version gets 78 percent of the total vote in terms of which version is better um people are complaining about like the 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 new social aspects and things like that um so first of all are you in your recollection like what the feedback you're getting is it mostly negative about the new features or was it mostly negative about, Oh my God, you guys bungled this and, and we couldn't access the site or it was slow for a few days and things like that. So there's a, you know, hope springs eternal. I, I like to believe that if we had launched it, well, people would have really understood and been excited about the social functionality. But I, the reality is like people hated it. And, and, and honestly, to this day, I still don't quite know why, they hated it so much. It was a pretty big departure from it. Um, part of the hate came from the people who made their living on Dig, and they didn't want to lose control of the front page, and they didn't want to customize the front page because that meant they couldn't like command the same amount of dollars getting content placed on on the site. So there are definitely entrenched like financial interests that really didn't want the site to change, and I know they were a big part of the resistance. Um, but but honestly, people just hated it. I, I don't think you can find anyone who didn't work on the product who, who felt it was better. But but personally, I, I felt it was a much better product. But but sometimes you have to wonder if maybe you're just like a little bit delusional at that point. Or too close to it. Or too close to it. Um, and then so are you guys seeing? I guess. Are you guys seeing in the logs that like uh, people are fleeing and things like that? So, so one of the interesting dynamics of the the dig traffic is that most of it was generated by um, search right, results. Right. So it took a while for the the impact to be completely obvious. Um, but part of the interplay here, which is like a, a little bit inside baseball, as they say, is dig had two different ad units. Um, so when you go to Facebook or Twitter, they have these ads in the stream, and Dig actually innovated the in-stream ad unit. Um, that was like one of their most important inventions and, and maybe, maybe their worst um, from a certain perspective. But the majority of our revenue came from this in-stream ad unit that we pioneered. And then for, search, uh, for pages that you hit from search, these were kind of these story pages. And those just had kind of remnant inventory from like a Google AdSense, and those actually monetized much worse. So interestingly, although our traffic wasn't impacted as heavily as you might imagine, because a lot of it was driven by Google, the actual monetization was damaged pretty heavily by losing these kind of list mm. um, story units. That That is super fascinating. So, okay, so th that's the first indication that, that uh, this is breaking or this is broken a bit. 
Um, I, but then, I mean, I remember this very clearly, like the the deluge of, of bad headlines, like PC World, you know, I'm sure everyone had this headline, has Dig dug its own grave or some version of that. Um, so again, uh, from an on the ground engineer's perspective, like, um, what are you... What are you guys feeling, seeing um, as like you're getting these these terrible reviews about the the redesign? Well, we we didn't feel too great about it. I, I think <clears throat> so. So the press, I will say, working at Dig, the, the press bothered me less than you might imagine, just because people had so many opinions about kind of what we were doing, and I think you got a pretty thick skin at some point. I can remember um, one day when one person on Twitter like literally found every dig employee they could and threatened to murder us. And that was just kind of the experience of working at dig at that point was there would just be like internet strangers, like threatening your life for, for some reason that they were extremely upset about. But, but maybe as like a, a quick anecdote of when it was really clear to me that the business wasn't working. We had one of our investors come up, and we were talking about our, our viral loop, you know, how could we just increase the virality of our social functionality? And then he put together this formula in, in Excel showing how easy it would be. And he was like, if you start with 100,000 users and then you have this viral coefficient, et cetera, like you'll have this huge growth. But then at the end, we're like, but we currently have like 2,000 active users. So like this math is fucked. Um, and that's when I realized like, there was no chance that this kind of virality or the social functionality was going to pick up in time. And it was, uh, I guess, like a, an enlightening discussion. Well, and then, as you had already mentioned, um, the, the third major factor here is that uh, talent is feeling like this is a sinking ship, and so let's get out. So it's almost like there's really no way... Uh, there's no way to... Win. Like, you had a failed... Uh, launch where it was a bit of a uh, a fiasco in terms of the site being down and and, and issues like that, uh, which either may or may not have like contributed to the bad headlines. Uh, but then even before that, like morale was already bad and talent was already leaving. That didn't help. Yeah, I think the the folks who stayed were were people who really believed in what the company was doing, but it. Ultimately, I think six months after the launch, the company was down to, I think, 40 people down from the high of 100 when I started. So we were running a pretty lean ship. Um, about a year in, I think we didn't have any product managers left, which probably didn't help us um, in terms of kind of finding something that got a little bit of virality or a little bit of like growth around it. So, so yeah, I, I do think that um, at that point, once the existing kind of team that had a lot of like quite strong folks involved in it started leading, it, it, it got pretty clear that writing this was going to be virtually impossible. And we did at that point start trying to understand how we could get acquired and what we could do to figure out next steps. Um, I want to I want to get to that in a second and 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 bring us to a landing. Um, but real quick, uh, so this has gone down in sort of Silicon Valley lore as. <clears throat> the community that dig had created moves on mass to reddit and reddit becomes reddit but as you noted you had already been a reddit user so uh again from your on the ground perspective like reddit you know actively courts digs community um do you feel like that that's what happened that uh whatever dig had uh moved over to reddit or reddit stole it or, or what so if you can find them, there's this amazing series of web comics that someone made, and there are literally like Reddit versus Dig web comics, and they're they're like incredibly detailed, like the drawings amazing, and there there's probably I don't know like 60 pages of them. I think there was like four parts, and it was this like idea of this web comic of like a war between Reddit and Dig, um, and then Reddit had mostly kind of red colors, and Dig had mostly blue colors. So it was kind of the, the visual like motif played out. So I, I think there was already kind of this sense that they were like competing um, offerings um, and kind of offering something similar to each other, although in the details they're quite different. Uh, my, my sense is that um, it's a little bit like Lyft versus Uber today, and most customers actually use both. Um, and I think that was also true for Dig and Reddit, that I think that most people using Dig were already Reddit users. And I think they just kind of became exclusively Reddit users at the end. 
once they stopped using dig. But I, I think, you know, like framing everything as like a, a great conflict, I think is like a really human thing to do. Mm. But but ultimately, I don't think dig like lost because Reddit like won. It's more like dig lost because we like jumped off a cliff without a parachute. Well, okay, so um, you so so uh, to sum up the TLDR, the story um, dig sort of sells and in, in pieces like Betaworks takes the site and the content and the brand, but then um, uh, the Washington Post, uh, what is it, the social code or whatever their 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 digital arm or something, and I think that's the part that you go with, right? Yeah. So so the team, all the people went with social code, which was part of the, what was called the Washington Post company at the time. Although since Bezos acquired the Washington Post, it's now been renamed to something else. But yeah, we, we go there, uh, work on kind of social advertising, um, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. And, and a few people are, are still with, with the acquiring company today, um, seven-ish years later. Although like many of us have kind of moved on to different things. All right, uh, two final questions then. Um, uh, just to let people know, you have gone on to great success. You've uh, you stayed at, at Social Code uh, for a couple of years. Um, you were a VP of platform technology. Uh, you you were at Uber for a couple of years, um, and you're at Stripe still. Is that right? Yeah, still yep. best best job I've ever had by far. Okay, so right then, first question of the two. Uh, what did the failure, I wanted to say fiasco, but let's not be that harsh. The failure of Dig version 4, what has that informed uh, for you as your career has gone forward? What did you learn from that? So when when I applied to Uber, part of the job description was I was looking for someone with grit. And, and I think I would not personally write a job description using the word grit anymore. I think it's kind of like a weird connotation. But for me, where I was at that time, like this is something I know about. Uh, I've seen, professionally speaking, some adversity, and I know how to overcome. So, so for me, I think it just, I just, I don't think I could ever imagine a stranger time than my time at Uber. Sorry, my, sorry, my time at Dig, rather. Let me retry that. I don't think I could ever imagine a stranger time than my time at Dig. And I think for me, that has just given me a confidence that I'll make it through and that there's nothing that can happen that hasn't happened to someone before and they got through it as well. Well, then the final one would be um, to anyone listening. Uh, is there a lesson that you would impart to them about um, about sticking with it, about uh, startups, about... Uh, <laughs> having an, uh, a project go haywire and wrong like uh, anyone listening what what would what would be any lessons that you learned from uh, dig that that could be useful to them I think there's a bunch of lessons that you can learn I think one lesson that that I learned is that it's, it's okay to care about what you do um, and it's okay yeah. to, to care about something succeeding and it's okay if something you care about fails I think that was very powerful. Um, I think one of the great things in Silicon Valley is there's so much opportunity to find different work that if you fail, you can, you can find something else. And I think that's really powerful. Um, and sometimes we try to avoid failure, but I think getting to failure quickly so you can go on to something that might work better for you is also like a really powerful idea. The, the, second, the second thing I would say is that with a good group of people, um, you can learn a ton even when things don't go well. And that really, it's always about the people in terms of kind of when when a job's going to be the right one for you. And sometimes the business doesn't go right, but as long as the people are great, you'll still learn a lot and have a lot to take forward from it. Well said. <laughs> um, Will Larson, uh, thanks for coming on the show, remembering all that, and, and frankly, um, sharing those lessons. Thank you for having me. If you like what you've heard on this episode, please support us by subscribing to the podcast so you can get great news stories and conversations every two weeks. And please buy the book that was based on this podcast, How the Internet Happened from Netscape to the iPhone by me, Brian McCullough. Order it now wherever books are sold. How the Internet Happened.